lecture was a challenge to the studio. It was a challenge to society in general, that kind of story, the idea of, of uh, a kidnap of somebody made into a drama. It was also a true story. John Fowles, the writer. Now, I know John's proclivity to his uh, dreams of capturing women as a, as a young man himself uh, must have come into the writing of The Collector later on. But there had been a case. A man, a young man, had won money on the football pools and had a crush on this girl. And he'd bought himself a motorcycle. And he used to go all the time to this house of this girl where she was living. And the mother used to say, oh, go on, go out with him. He's nice. And uh, the girl would say, no, it's awful. I don't want to go out with him because he was sort of, you know, he was, a, I think he was a clerk in a bank. Well, eventually, he wore her down and she went out with him, got on the back, back of the motorcycle, and she was never seen again. And she was found in the ground in a four by four hole in the ground. And she'd been there for four to six months. She was so badly damaged that she was in a mental institute for about two or three years. I never spoke to her, and I didn't want to speak to her. And the young man only got about two years in jail, which is absolutely atrocious. But it's my understanding that certainly John has to have taken some of that to have come up with the story of the collector. This novel particularly was a little difficult because there was no dialogue in it. And we realized that the book existed to a great degree upon the simple um, story of it. Man takes girl captive, but also on the writing of the prose. So we did what many screenwriters do if they have half a brain. We took the prose and turned it into dialogue. I suppose it was the loneliness and being far away from any place that made me decide to buy the house. And all the inner thoughts that are there as prose, we let him say. Even though I'd made all the preparations and knew where she was every minute of the day. William Wyler uh, directed it. He had just come off Ben-Hur, so it was a good change for him. <laughs> From a cast of thousands and thousands of poor people. I think Willie was certainly in his 60s when we did that film. The absolute control of a situation. The commander, the captain of the ship, that's what he was. I figured that he didn't really speak English. That's what I figured. I thought he's from Alsace. He's grown up speaking French. He's, he's not a man who expresses himself easily in English. However, if he wanted to say something, I remember the character goes back to the bank where he worked before he won the fortune. And just before the take, you know, in that moment when you're sort of open to it. He just sidled up to me and said, um, the taste of the stamps. That's the kind of direction that every actor needs. We went vacation hunting in London, we're in the back of this limousine, and he had the script, he'd not looked at it yet. And he was reading it, you see? And he said, oh! And he threw it in the carpet of the car. And, and a producer, a guy called Judd Bernard, and my friend, who was one of the producers, and I, said, Willie, what's wrong? He said, I don't make pictures about impotent boys. We said, but Willie, that's all it is. <laughs> no. And he kind of just came really close to me, and he said, I'm not making the book. I said, what are you making? He said, I'm making a love story. I love you. The beauty of a film like The Collector is that William Wyler, the director, using the very young, malleable Terence Stamp as his vessel, 
found a way to look into the soul and eyes of, of a monster and figure out who this guy is. He was the most beautiful boy you'd ever seen in your life. And not unaware of it, because he said to my friend John, the only thing I can't see in my playing this part is that she could never reject me. <laughs> right? We said, they'll make you up. <laughs> And I know that some people have said that Terrence Stamp was too extreme. For example, he takes body posture, where sometimes he hunches himself and the shoulders almost turn in and he cocks his head slightly. And it gives the appearance of somebody who's so pathetic and so within himself. But I think it's just a magnificent performance because he doesn't romanticize him. It's actually a very bleak portrayal of a fractured human being. At the same time, you truly can understand his humanity, his needs, his angst, why he fixated on this particular girl. How was it with Terrence Stamp during this film? Um, rather oblique, rather lonely, uh, rather uh, disconnected, um, but obviously proved well for the film. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe those were a, the, necessary to make to cause the effect that the film had i would hope one wouldn't have to resort to that i would hope that you'd have to you know both of you would be good enough actors but uh, but if in fact that was some ploy then that was their game it wasn't mine he wanted a kind of constant terror from her that's you know really very difficult to act so he said to me off the set, I don't want you to be friends with her. You know, I don't want you to talk to her. I don't want you to be nice to her. We'll just, you know, this is going to look cruel, but we'll get a great performance out of her. I uh, was shooting another film in England at Shepperton, and in between, literally, lunch, I was raced over to another studio to test for the collector. Um, and I got the part. We started shooting in England. And we filmed an entire sequence with a wonderful actor called Kenneth Moore. In the book, there is another character who has as much space as the girl and the guy. And that character was a painter, uh, an older man who was in love with the heroine and with whom she was in love. And that is what gets her through the capture the story of the collector is not let me out, let me out, let me out. It's the idea that love will keep you alive and, and that, that, that love will give you strength in your darkest hour. And so we filmed for three weeks in England that relationship. And he watched the film when it was over and he said no. And all that remains of this actor who was a brilliant British actor is one shot of him with his back to the camera in a pub. Wilder said it takes away from the compactness of it all. Next thing I know is we're going to America. I, I, we always used to joke it was because William Wilder didn't like the English weather and he got a cold and he wanted to go back to Southern California. His wife indeed had said to him, Willie, if you spend another two years abroad, I'm no longer your wife. So, boom, 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 up we get, visas, and we're all off on the plane and we come to Columbia here to start shooting. Because there was only one set. She'd never done a part, only teeny little things, scared out of her mind. Why have you brought me here? And Wilder did what a lot of directors did in those days, which is not sure, totally delightful. He frightened her to make her frightened. And some time during the movie, she fled. Let me go! He and I tortured her. That was how we worked. The atmosphere on the set became intolerable for me. I was ignored. I was, um, I was treated basically as a non-person. And so my performance suffered. And I lost confidence in myself. So I was fired. 
quite rightly. And that's when the worldwide search for an actor to replace me happened. And it was everybody. It was Natalie Wood, it was Julie Christie, Susanna York, uh, it was name that, it was everybody. Every single actor the same age as myself was tested for that part. Now I was hidden away in Palm Springs. I was not sent back to England. And a week later, I got a telephone call that Mr. Wyler and Robert Swink, his editor, were coming down to Palm Springs. And did I have a script? And I said, no, but I know it. I know, because I said we. So they said, Mr. Wyler will be there on Sunday. Be ready. So I said, well, fine, but it'll have to be 11, because mass is at 10. Oh, OK. So I went into this room, and there was Mr. Wyler and Mr. Swink and myself. Total silence, not a hello, not nice to see you, not nothing. Just sit down. So I sat down, and Swink read Stamp's part, and we went through the entire play. I'd, without a script. And at the end of it, Mr. Wyler stood up and said, see you on the set on Monday. Walked out of the room. So there I was, back in the movie again. Wait! No, wait, no, no! Wait! Come back, please, come back! Maybe I was the right one for the part. That's what happens. I mean, we're not collie waddled. Molly coddled, Molly coddled, <laughs> um, in our business. Uh, it's glamorous, yes, nowadays, but uh, when you start out, uh, uh, and especially in repertory, you're a slave. But you're not going to tie me up. I have to. But I've promised. You have two rather extraordinary actors. Uh, Samantha Egger, who was nominated for an Oscar, richly deserved that. She found a way to create a woman in peril who was not a kind of cliché. She wasn't Fay Ray screaming as she's taken off by uh, the big gorilla. Instead, you had a woman who tried to figure out how to outwit her captor. It feels like my appendix. You must get me a doctor. And so she's doing what all women have had to do in, over history, which is read the men who have some sort of power over them and try to figure out the best way to either lessen the man's power over them or increase their power within the relationship to a point where it's sort of semi-equal. So she tries everything. She tries standing up to him. She tries defying him. She tries weeping. She tries sex. She tries creating this domestic fantasy with him. She tries to show him all those sides of womanhood, desperately hoping that he's going to pick one that's going to make him actually feel something in his heart that might let her go. And of course, she fails, 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 fails. And you, and you have to be able to see the growing panic in her face. And um, I, I think she pulls it off. It was extremely traumatic. And um, uh, I had an, in an incredible aide that Mike Frankovich, who was the head of uh, Columbia at that time, uh, brought on board the production. And her name was Kathleen Freeman, who is one of the most brilliant comedic actors in America. And she was brought in to be a support to me with this uh, stress and imprisonment, etc., and the subject matter. I think if I'd been on my own and had to go through that, that I would have ended up in a mental institute too. And I give all credit to Kathleen Freeman because she was just the, this dear, dear soul of love uh, for the rest of my life too, in my life. Uh, she was sent. She was sent to be with me and saved me. Well, sooner or later, they're going to find me. Never. After the movie w was over, I came here, and I went to dinner with Weiler and his wife. 
And as we got out of the car uh, to go into Chasers, I think it was, Wiley turned to me and said, if she lived, you'd be rich. I don't want to give away all of the story, but it had the guts not to take the course that the viewer would naturally want to see happen in that saga. I think if you made the collector today, she would have to get away. And not only would she have to get away, she'd have to have some sort of revenge, she'd have to kill him, or you'd have to see him in prison, or a trial. There would have to be some big sort of soaring success for her. Um, and, you know, I think that's the reason that a lot of movies that come out of that era have lasted, and a lot of movies that we're making today won't. Uh, we wrote an ending which um, my partner John and I felt actually was terrific where she manages, don't ask me how, I forget how, to lock him in the, in the cellar and escape. I never heard any, anything about the ending, and, and as, I, as I was so, the book was so in my skin, that, sh that was the ending that it had to be. But Willie had promised his wife, his brother, himself, the author of the book, of course, he would not change it. We didn't say anything. We were so uh, entranced by the notion that it was Wilder at all who was there. He was the best of all American directors, you know. And what he wanted was to hold to the book. I thought how happy I'd be. Feelings I'd had these weeks, she was here. The ending of The Collector, in fact, is almost illegal because the stamp character, Freddie Clegg, gets away with murder. And you weren't allowed to do that in those days. John Trevelyan was the censor. Mr. Trevelyan had just got married. And he was about 67 at the time. And he'd married a 30-year-old. In fact, they, they, they had twins. And so he's watching The Collector. And it's a long film, you know, and it's a... And he nods off, and the end of the film comes. I mean, he never sees the end. And so, oh, he wakes up, and, and so, oh, yeah, oh, John Trevelyan, yes. And he signs it. So had he been awake, we might have had a totally different film. Yes, he would have been arrested. Perhaps it was my fault, after all, that she did what she did and lost my respect. Then I thought, no, it was her fault. She asked for everything she got. I don't think that the collector made hordes of unfortunates run out and do what they weren't about to do anyway. I mean, <laughs> if films had had the influence on people they ought to have had, we'd have had a most charming race of people, wouldn't we? All Cary Grants, all <laughs> able to speak delicious dialogue, right? Dress beautifully, walk and talk engagingly instead of the human beings we live with. I was so lucky to have just edged in at the end of the Hollywood golden era of these brilliant directors. And Willie set me on my entire path of my future. He so grounded my entire profession within myself as to how to be a film actor and how to respect the industry and, and how serious it was, and how dedicated. It sounds like what started as what could have been a bad experience somehow turned into a great one. Absolutely. And actually much more beneficial for the professional side of it that Wyler was a good experience.